Amen. All right, so Judges chapter 10. So we're heading into, we're just getting done with the story of um, Abimelech. Of course, we had um, one of the greatest judges and judges uh, in the book of Judges, which was Gideon. He had this son um, from a concubine named Abimelech, which was pretty much a terrible story. Abimelech murdered all Gideon's other sons, and then we see that whole story. We took a couple weeks to go through Judges chapter 9. Now in Judges chapter 10, we have kind of a short chapter here. There's not, it seems like there's not a lot happening in Judges chapter 10. You say, what, what could we um, learn from Judges chapter 10? But let's go through Judges chapter 10, and I'll, I'll show you um, what we can study from this, and we'll do some, some application at the end. So it is a short chapter. It's right after the death of Abimelech. And in Judges chapter 10, look down at verse number 1. That's what the Bible says. And it says, And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir in the Mount Ephraim. Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 7. So I'm going to show you, first thing I'm going to show you is why, if you've ever wondered why all these, you know, um, genealogies are in the Bible, um, I'll show you at least one reason why they're in the Bible um, this evening. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 7, and we can see that Toa, this judge that is risen up here um, in Judges chapter 10 and verse number 1, he's also mentioned in uh, 1 Chronicles in the genealogies. So in 1 Chronicles chapter 7, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the sons of Issachar... So Issachar had these sons. So basically, 1 Chronicles is giving the genealogies of the tribes of Israel. And whenever you read the Bible, I mean, you, you, you would be uh, uh, dishonest, in my opinion, if you didn't get to the genealogies part and at least say, man, this is a lot, just reading through these genealogies. But it's really good for these genealogies is to be able to have them, to use them as a study tool to kind of go back and match up certain things in the actual history. So Judges is a history book. So we're reading about things that actually happened in the book of Judges. And in 1 Chronicles, we see the, the, um, the genealogies here. And it says, the sons of Issachar, and look at verse number 2, and the sons of Tola, Uzai, and Rephiah, and Jeriel, and Jema, and Jishem, and Shemuel, the heads of their father's house, to wit of Tola. And now, so we see that Tola here matches the Tola uh, that we're reading about in Judges. And then we see some information about what these people were like. And it says, to wit of Tola, it says, they were valiant men of might in their generations, whose number was in the days of David, two and 20,600. So the Bible here is saying that Tola, these men, they were mighty men of valor at this time. Okay, so that kind of gives us a little bit of information on what the men were like underneath Tola in Judges chapter 10. And we're going to apply that at the end of the chapter. Look at verse number 2 of Judges chapter 10. So it's always neat how these things match up in the Bible. Now, it says Tola the son of Pua, just so um, for the record. And then it does say Issachar's sons were Tola and Pua. But, you know, you could just say that basically Toa was a son of Pua as well. It was just not listed exactly there. But we see that it's from the same family, that that name is from this family of Issachar. And what these men were like was really what I wanted to point out, is that they were mighty men of valor. So remember that. Look at verse number two. And he judged Israel 20 and three years. So Toa was a judge, and he judged for 23 years and was buried in Shamar. Now, I mean, there wasn't much going on. He just judged Israel for 23 years. It wasn't this great story like Gideon where he, he freed them from these massive armies of people that were oppressing them from the east. And look at verse number 3. And after him, now we see another judge, arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel 20 and two years. And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities, which were called Havoth, Havoth Jair, and unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. So Jair was a son of Manasseh, which was where Gilead was, which was on the east side. You remember the, the, the tribe of Manasseh was split. You had the half tribe of Manasseh that, that settled on the east side of the Jordan. They were one of the tribes that said, hey, we're good here. We don't want to cross. Remember that? And then, you know, as long as they went and they fought with the Israelites, which they did, they could just have that land on the east side. So this is East Manasseh. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 3. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 3. 
And so this is East Manasseh is what we're talking about where Jair is from, where Gilead, the city, is. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 3 and look at verse number 14. We'll see some more information about Jair. And the Bible says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 14, Jair, the son of Manasseh, took all the country of Argob under the coasts of Geshuru and Machathai and called them after his own name, Bashan Havanth Jair, and unto this day. So here we see um, this guy, and he liked, you know, he liked to name towns after himself. Okay? So he had lots of cities, is what I'm trying to get at. There was lots of things, times were good under Jair. Okay? He had lots of cities. He was naming all these cities after himself. You know, there was abundance at this time, and there were valiant men at this time. Okay? And look at verse number 5. And the Bible says, And Jair died and was buried in Cammon. So here we had some, you know, some time in Israel that was not a bad time. You, know, you, had, you had peace. And you had peace for 23 years under um, Toa, and then you had peace for um, 22 years under Jair. So yeah, I mean, you had a 55-year chunk of peace here, which, um, you know, there wasn't, much, there wasn't any war that we know of that was going on here, um, especially in this area. Look at verse number 6 of Judges chapter 10. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So, again, right after the judge is dead, the children do evil in the sight of the Lord. It sounds familiar. Are you recognizing a pattern in Judges? And serve Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years, and the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. So look, again, they're on the east side of Jordan, verse number 9. Moreover, so they've, they've abandoned the Lord on the east side of Jordan. But what's interesting, because look what happens in verse number 9. Moreover, it says, you know, even more than this, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was sore distressed. So basically this tribe, this east tri side of Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan, they turned from the Lord and they abandoned God and they started serving all these false gods and you know God sold them into the hands of their enemies and then their enemies just kept going into Israel. Okay, so it just, the, the sins of the, the people on the east side of Jordan ended up coming over the Jordan River into Israel itself, into Judah, because Judah's on the west side of Jordan. So, I mean, this is a good example of, you know, a little bit of sin, you know, spreads. Sin spreads, and it infects, and it costs other people. Sin doesn't just cost you, it costs those around you, those next to you, those around you, related to you, whatever. Look at verse number 10. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? The Zidonians also and the Amicalites and the Maonites did oppress you, and you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. God is saying to them, he's like, we've been down this road. He's like, you know, I've delivered you from these people and you go and you just serve them again and you just adopt their gods again. And in verse 13, he says, yet, he's like, even though you've been down this road, he's like, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. It's like, for this reason, I will deliver you no more. And then I like verse 14. He says, go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Now look, I mean, the long, God's long suffering is over at this point. And he's basically saying to them, these people have turned and they've worshipped all these gods who are no gods. These dumb idols, these gods, it's not like they're lesser gods, they're no gods. So God says, God says to them, hey, wh what are you crying to me for? I mean, does it make sense? I mean, doesn't it seem fair what the Lord is saying here? The Lord is saying, he's like, you've abandoned me and you've gone to worship a rock or a piece of wood, or a dumb idol, or some stupid non-god that these people around you that I warned you about since the beginning of human civilization, he's like, I've warned you against this, and you've, you've done it. He's like, go, go ask them for help. 
I mean, you're worshiping them, go ask them for help. Look at verse 15. I mean, it's perfectly fair. It's perfectly logical for God to say that. In verse 15, the Bible says, And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seem good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. It's interesting, when it comes to them actually needing help, though, I mean, this is how stupid we are as people. Okay, this is how stupid we are and how you know, big of backstabbers against God we are. Because, look, we'll go and we'll worship all these other gods. And we'll, you know, because we feel that there's some benefit. You know, I'm sure it just came in, in a way where they thought they were just going to fit in with their neighbors and just maybe not offend their neighbors and all this kind of stuff. And pretty soon, they're just adopting all these cultures. I'm sure they married some of their neighbors and they married into these tribes. And then, you know, when they were celebrating holidays and, you know, can't you just see how it could come in? And pretty soon, all these cultures and these traditions, and pretty soon, they're worshiping all these false gods. They're literally turning away from God and worshiping these false gods. And it didn't take long. It was like one generation after the judge died. But then, when it actually comes to them needing help, I mean, this is how dumb people are. Because they know that the rock isn't going to help them. They know that the false god isn't going to help them. Verse 15, they know they need help, and they're like, hey, we, we, know, that that, that, you know, we know that that can't help us. We know. We have sinned, they say, because they actually need help at that point because they're going into oppression. They're being oppressed by people around them. So just notice that it took the oppression to get that light bulb to come on in their, in their mind. Okay? Before that, they're just doing all this stuff, and they're just not even, it's like they're not even noticing it. You're like, man, they're dumb. Well, maybe we're dumb too. Let's just keep talking this evening. Look at verse 16. And they put away. So there, there's some pressure on them now. They're being oppressed now. So they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Funny how that works. When they actually get right with God, God's heart towards them turns. I mean, it was just two verses earlier where God said, go cry unto the false gods. He says, go cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. And now he, he's, he's grieving for them because they turn towards him. Amen. So, I mean, God is, is, is a merciful God. I mean, that is one just overarching theme of judges that you can't miss. Amen. Is that God is long-suffering, but he, he is, his long-suffering has a limit, but he's just endlessly merciful. Because they turn back towards him and they serve the Lord and right away, I mean, in the same sentence, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. I mean, before, when they had still turned against him, he's like, go cry, uh, go cry unto the false gods. And now his heart is grieved. Look at verse 17. And the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and princes of Gilead said to one another, what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So here they're looking, they're gathering, they're looking for a leader. But then they say, what man? He's like, and right away at the end, at the end, that end phrase, that end sentence, they say, what man is it? It doesn't say, what man is it that will just free us from our oppressors? It says, he shall be head over all of us. Doesn't that sound familiar with what they were asking Gideon to be a king? Look, these people are just itching for a king. These people want a king so badly. You can see it in Judges even before we get to the first king of Israel. Look, but you can just, you can just feel that desire for an earthly king from them. But look, I want you to recognize this. Notice how the Judges didn't have a, a dynastic um, secession. Notice how the judges that we see that God raises up, they didn't, they didn't, Gideon, Gideon didn't have his son be the next judge, and Gideon's son, son, and then his son, son, son. That's not how the judges worked. Do you ever think about that? These people wanted a king. They wanted a dynasty for a king to rule them, and the king's son to rule them, and the king's son, son to rule them. That's what they wanted, but that was not God's plan. That was not God's plan. It makes you realize that they didn't get the pattern. They didn't see the pattern. God, look, God would raise a judge out of necessity for them. He would raise a judge out of necessity after they turned on him most of the time. 
The judge gone, judge dies, and they turn away. Are you seeing this pattern? Look, if there was always, if there was, God was trying to, God was trying to show them this pattern. If there was always a king there, they, they would just always have a king to lean on. They would just always have that king there. A king, I mean, this is why God didn't want a king. The judge rose up to free them from the oppression after they got right. That's what the judge did. If there was a king there, they wouldn't get it. They wouldn't get it. A king interferes with God's plan. The, the plan of chastisement and then repentance. Amen. Amen. That is what the judge was for. And you can see, look, you can see that God wanted the people relying on who? Who did God want the people in Judges again and again and again? Because what was the judge there to do? He's there to judge the law. He's there to just, that's what Gideon said. He said, the Lord shall rule over you. Gideon was not there to rule over them. He was there to judge the law. He was there to interpret the law for them. He was there to, you know, show them what God wanted for them. God ro ro rules over Israel in Judges. God just happens to raise up a judge after they, you know, get chastised and have repented. Okay, if there's a king there, they would just always rely on the king. So, I mean, and that's exactly what happened, by the way, once we get into the kings, is they rely on the king. They rely on the king whether it's good or whether he's bad. And guess what? Most of the time they were bad. Most of the time the kings were bad. Most of the time the kings did evil in the sight of the Lord. Not good. So God is trying to teach the children of Israel to rely on Him. Not some earthly king. That's the point of the model of the judges that we see again and again and again. Look, God, I mean, that, that's, that's God. God doesn't want to force you. God wants you to choose to follow Him. That's why we have free will. That's why salvation itself is based on what? It's based on your belief. You don't have to believe anything. I mean, we see that there is nothing more obvious than that, is that people in this world don't have to believe anything. They have to want to believe something. And if they want, I mean, that's, it's, it's all theirs. If they truly believe it, then they can be saved. But that's what God wants. God doesn't want to force anyone, because you can't force somebody to believe something. You can't force that. So that, that's just a, a side note, that they're looking for that king. God doesn't want them to have a king. God wants them to turn back to him and rely on him. And that cycle of chastisement and repentance and a judge was just part of that plan a king is a figurehead that he knew that the people would just focus on and then they would lose sight of the Lord because of the king and, and it, you know if the king was focused on the Lord it's fine but most of the time we know how that worked out okay so let's uh, let's look at some application here so we see we see a lot of cycles in in judges and especially in judges chapter 10 we see this cycle playing out again so we can see this cycle once again that we've seen over and over repeating itself. Now here's what's interesting. I was reminded of this when I was reading Judges chapter 10. And it reminded me of something that I had read before. And I want to just read it for you now. But in 1787, Alexander, Alexander Titler, a Scottish history professor at the University of Edinburgh, documented eight steps of a democracy, eight steps of a de democratic civilization that it would go through, eight stages that it would go through. And I want to show you how the book of Judges and the civilization of Israel actually matches that pretty closely. Even though that this professor, his um, assessment, it's a secular view. It's a secular view of things. But look, he's, he's a historian. He's just looking back at civilizations. He's looking back at civilizations, at what's happening, and he's matching up things that, you know, fit into all these stages. Now, first of all, um, before we get into it, because we're going to apply it to us as well, we're not a democracy, okay? We are actually a constitutional republic in this country. Well, at least I think we are, okay? I, I think it was supposed to be that way, and, you know, we shall see, okay? But... Um, let me just give you a secular view of, you know, this man's stages of a democratic civilization and look at it as we can match it to Judges chapter 10. The first stage is this, okay? 
It's from bondage to spiritual faith is what this man said for stage number one. Now we see this pattern again and again in Judges. Now keep in mind, this is a secular view. He's still recognizing that spiritual faith. Okay, look, you see this pattern in Judges. They come out of bondage and they have great faith, right? Step number two is spiritual faith to great courage. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 2. So they will from spiritual faith to great courage. So during and right after the Lord delivers them, we see that the men have courage to follow the Lord. And we see that in Judges chapter 10. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 2, where the Bible says, And the sons of Tola, Uzai and Rephaiah, and Jeriel and Jamai, and Jibsam, and Shemuel, heads of their father's house, to wit, of Toa, they were valiant men of might in their generations. So these were brave, valiant men at this time that were just coming out of, you know, bondage. Look back at verse number 4 of Judges chapter 10. The next stage in democracy, is, uh, is a, in the stage of democracy, is, is number 4, is from liberty. So we went from courage to liberty, and now we go from liberty to abundance. Well, look at verse number 4. It also matches. The next judge, he, this is what the Bible says about Jair. And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. So here we see that this man, this judge, he just had all this, he had all these cities. And he named all these cities. And we saw um, other parts of the Bible talked about how you know, he named all these cities after himself. This man had abundance. I mean, there was abundance going on here. Okay. Now, the next stages I'm just going to read for you, but they basically all fall into one verse in Judges chapter 10. But the stage 5 is from abundance to complacency. So you go from abundance to complacency. You go from complacency to apathy. So complacency means that you know it's not really right. If I'm complacent, it means I know it's not really right, but it's, it's fine. I'm just going it, to, I'm going to be okay with it. I'm going to just be okay with it. Apathy, so we go from abundance to complacency, and we go from complacency to apathy. Apathy means I just don't care. Apathy means I'm just not going to pay attention. I just don't care. It's just like I, it's like, you know, you just don't care about anything. Step seven is from apathy to dependence. From apathy to dependence. And finally, step eight is from dependence back to bondage. Look at Judges chapter 10 and verse number six. All these last four steps are captured in Judges 10, 6. And the Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. And then, of course, they go into bondage to these very people. So they went from abundance, and they went into... They just... They just... They were complacent. They were complacent. They probably started getting, like I said, they got too close to these people. They married into these people. They got, is it really that bad that our son married um, a Zidonian? Is it really that bad that we have to do all these different cultures now in our family? They were just complacent. And then they became apathetic. And pretty soon they're serving other gods. Pretty soon they've turned against the Lord himself. And then they go into bondage. But look, it, it certainly fits. I mean, judges and the patterns that this man came up with, it certainly fits into, you know, the children. We see it with Israel. Now look, now here's the irony and the thing that I want to talk about this evening. It all went wrong, those last four stages. It all went wrong in their civilization during times of what? During times of peace. It all went wrong when there was relatively no trouble in the land. They went from abundance to complacency to apathy to bondage, all during times of peace in their time. They had that 55 years of peace. So I want to talk about just for a few minutes this evening in closing in Judges chapter 10, peacetime. I want to give you two things to think about, about times of peace. I have news for you. You are in peacetime right now. Okay, you are in peacetime. The first point I want to make is this. Peacetime is not good for a nation. You say, what? 
Look, I'm not saying peace is bad. Okay? I'm not saying peace is a bad thing. But here's the problem. Look, peace itself is a good thing. Not having war is a good thing. Peace is not a bad thing, but men during peace do bad things. That's the problem. And that's the problem in Judges chapter 10. And that, I'm going to show you, is the problem you know, in our country as well. Look, America isn't, isn't bad. The idea is good. The plan was good. As good as any plan I could even think of. The problem with America is Americans. That's the problem with America. The problem with America is what the Americans do. It's us. I hate to break it to you. But here's the thing. Peace. Let's look at some trends. I went and I picked up some trends. Um, I love trending things. So if you look at the beginning of our nation, I just want to show you the intervals of war. Just for a few minutes. I want to show you the average intervals of wars in the United States. And let's look at where we are today compared to the average intervals of war during the, the whole history of our country. Let's just do a history of the United States in four minutes right here. So let's go through the, the, the general wars. I'm not going to mention wars overseas for the most part that didn't affect you know, the, the, the civilian population of the United States. I'm going to really mention like wars that were either fought here or greatly affected the population here. I mean, the first one is obviously the War for Independence. That I'm, going to end, I'm going to mention the end of the wars. The, the War for Independence, which ended in 1783. Then you had, in 1795, um, you had the Cherokee Wars. There was lots of Indian Wars in the United States. Okay? So basically you had about 12 years between those wars. Then you had the War of 1812 against England, which was about you know, 19 years from you know, the latest Indian War that was happening. Then you had you know, various Indian Wars from 1812 to 1840. Then you had in 1835, you had the Texas Revolution against Mexico. And then, you know, in 1848, you had the Mexican-American War. So in between those two is about 13 years. Various more Indian Wars from 1848 through 1900s. This was all happening in the United States. Then, of course, um, 1848 was the Mexican-American War. The Civil War ended in 1865. That's a big one, the Civil War. So about 10 years after, you know, um, or about, you know, 12 years after, 13 years after, 14 years after, you had the Civil War happen. Then you had more Indian Wars um, in the 1900s. You had, in 1898, you had the Spanish-American War. Okay, and then, of course, in 1918, about 20 years later, you had World War I end. That was the ending of World War I. That was a big one. Okay, now that wasn't fought on American soil, but that affected the entire country. That affected the entire population of the country, the economy of the country, everything was, was brought um, to a screeching halt and retooled for that war. Then you had, of course, in 1945, about 20 years later, you had World War II, of course. And that, of course, affect, affected the entire country as well. After World War II, you had the uh, Korean War in 1953. Eight years later, 10 years later, you had the Vietnam War in the 60s, uh, for 10 years into the 70s. Look, now those were foreign wars, the Korean War and the Vietnam Wars. They were foreign wars, but I'm counting them because there was a draft involved, and, and people were just, I mean, imagine somebody coming to your family and saying, we're taking your son and he's going to war. And that affected the entire country. That affected um, the United States. So look, I mean, even if you count Vietnam, I mean, the last time we actually declared war, by the way, was World War II. So we haven't declared war in this country for 70 years. Of course, but there was Korea and Vietnam. Now look, here's the problem. Here's the problem according to Judges chapter 10, according to what I told you about the stages of a civilization, of a democracy. Yes, there have been conflicts since then, but look, we have had general peace in this country for nearly 50 years. You say, oh, but we're going to war over overseas somewhere all the time. Yeah, but most people are disconnected to that. Most people, you, people have never been in the history of the United States disconnected more from military action overseas. It's an all-volunteer military. Nobody's getting drafted. It's fought, fought by volunteers. So here's the, here's the first, just two things I want to point out about this. We've had a long stretch where we haven't been disrupted by war in this country. 
a really long stretch. When you look at the entire, I mean, it's a trend, okay? When you look at the entire history of war in the United States, I mean, we've had a serious drop-off of, of, of disrupting war in this country. You can't disagree with it. But, so here's the first point, we're due for some trouble. If you just look at trends and time frames, we're, we're due for some, just from, just from the proven cycles, just from the numbers, we're due for some trouble. Throughout the history of the country, there's been a domestic war or a domestic disturbance from war every 15, maybe 20 years at, at the longest stretch that you can find. So just something to keep in mind is that we're due for some trouble. The second point is really the main point I want to make, and that's this. How's peace working out for us? How are we doing with it? How did, the, how did the Israelites handle their 55 years of peace? Did they just get God's blessings heaped upon them and just serve the Lord harder and serve the Lord harder and serve the Lord harder? How are we doing? How are we doing? Let's look at the stages now. Let's look at the stages. We looked at those stages of, of, a, of a civilization and compared them to judges. Let's look at those same stages and let's compare them to us. Let's do this exercise quickly. Where, what stage are we at? do you think? From bondage to spiritual faith is the first stage. Well, I mean, that's pretty easy to recognize that one. You know, they, were, they, were, they rebelled from England, and they were under the, the bondage of the king of England, and you had the revolution from spiritual faith to great courage. Okay, I mean, I think we're past that. I mean, you know, are, are we still courageous? Um, that's, you know, debatable, but then we went from courage to liberty. So that one, you know, we got that, right? Because we did get liberty. We did, you know, win the revolution. We did, you know, win liberty. We won the War of 1812. You know, we've definitely been to this stage of liberty. So we're past, you know, point number three for sure, from courage to liberty. How about from liberty to abundance? Have we been here? No one has ever seen abundance like the United States of America, like the history of the United States of America. There's never even been uh, a, a, a close comparison to the abundance that this country has seen and the, the, the advancements that this country has produced. So we've definitely been to this stage of abundance. I would argue, though, tonight that we're moving past even this stage of abundance. In school, I remember, uh, you know, I went to public school. They would always ask us this question. I don't know if you, you all ever got asked this question, but one question that they would always ask the public school kids, or, and I, I remember in grade school being asked this question, they're always asking you what you want to do for a living. What do you want to be when you, want, when you grow up? And they, they would always ask this question of, do you think that you'll be more successful than your dad? So that was a big measuring stick. And that's, that's been a big measuring stick in the United States of America, is that every generation is able to to have a, a step up. And of course, we're talking about secular success and not spiritual success, but most times people would say yes. They would say yes, of course, yes, of course. But look, here's the thing. Real wages in the United States hasn't moved since the 60s. What do I mean by real wages? I mean wages that you're paid compared to the price of how much everything rises through inflation. Number two, you have to consider that now both parents for the last 60, 70 years both parents have to work now. So not only have real wages not increased, but both parents have to work to, you know, make a living now. And that combined with Social Security benefits and all these other programs that will be basically be unfundable. I mean, it's, the math just doesn't work in 20 years. It shows us that, look, if you ask me, we've crested this hill of abundance about 25 to 30 years ago in this country. Yeah, I mean, you can still make it. If you work hard in this country, and especially if you want to raise a family on a, on a single income, you better work really hard in this country. And you're probably going to have to do two things. You're probably going to have to work harder than most people. But here's the thing. We've crested this, this hill of, of peak abundance, peak success in this country decades ago. Decades ago. So the fifth step is this. Com abundance to complacency. You say, are we there? Have we gone from abundance to complacency? Look, have you ever heard of the baby boomer generation? I mean, I don't like blanket statements, but if complacency doesn't describe this generation, I don't know what does. 
I mean, basically a generation that, that grew up and worked and had their career, and they, just, they were just like, you know what? I know it's not right, but I got mine. You know, I know these things aren't right. Look at all the things. Look at all the things that weren't right. They settled for the liberalism. They settled for the, the, the immoralism. They settled for the global homo movement that's taken over the country and the entire world. They, they, it all happened on their watch. But they got their 401ks. And they got their pensions. And they got, you know, they got their, their social security checks. And they're like just, I, I think most of them know it's not right. But they're just not going to do anything about it. They just weren't going to do anything about it. You say, how can I say it? Because they didn't do anything about it. Right. Because now we're dealing with it. Because now we're living under this. And then, you know, you got complacency. The last, the sixth step is complacency to apathy. So you go from, you know, this idea that, you know, it's not just, ah, it's just not right, but I'm not going to do anything, to I just don't care. Now, if that's not this generation we're living in, I, I, I don't know what is. Amen. Talk about an apathetic generation that we're living in. I mean, look, the, the generation of, of, of people under 35, under 30, it, it's, it's, it shocks me every day of my life. They could care less. They have no motiva motiv motivation at all. I mean, they don't want to work. And here's the thing, they don't have to work. They don't have to work. And that le leads us to step number seven, which is apathy to dependence. They don't have to work because they're dependent. I mean, Here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. I mean, how many people are dependent on the government today in this country? I mean, dependence, we're there, folks. I mean, is that not the premise of this entire year? I mean, look, when I, I told you at the beginning of this year that it almost seemed like they were trying to get everybody on government assistance, remember when I told you that? Look, it's not because I'm a prophet. It's because this is what they've been doing for decades. And I just, I'm just old enough to recognize the pattern. That's all. It's just more of the same. But guess what? Guess what? Step eight is dependence to bondage. That's the problem. That's the problem. Is bondage is the last one. You think dependence sounds good. I don't have to do anything. I can just lay back and let myself be taken care of. But bondage is the end. Go back to Judges. So, in my opinion, we're somewhere in between 7 and 8. We're towards the end of this ballgame. We're somewhere in between, you know, apathy to dependence and dependence to bondage. We're, we're playing around somewhere in that area there. And, I mean, I can, show you, I can show you math to prove it. But, I mean, we're somewhere there. Probably towards, you know, closer to the end. The more dependent we get, the closer we are to number 8. Okay, go back to Judges. Now, look. This will, this will, our country will follow this pattern. It will follow this pattern unless there's good news. I'm not just here to depress you tonight. Go to Judges chapter 10 and look at verse number 15. At any time, here's the beauty of it, and here's the beauty of Judges. At any time, we can become verse 15. At any time. And look at verse 15. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seem good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Look, it was also important that they had a proper leader, but when they did not, things went downhill fast. But look, here's the thing. At any time, we could get right. At any time, turn to Ezekiel chapter 22. At any time, at any time, we could get things right. And God would change the way he feels about us. Look at Ezekiel 22 and verse number 30. Here's more good news right here. Now here comes the good news. That was depressing for the last 15 minutes. Here's the good news. Look at Ezekiel 22 and verse number 30. The Bible said this. It says this. It says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land, that what? That I should not destroy it. Now look what he says here. He says, I'm, I'm looking for a man. He's looking for one man that can stand in the gap. 
that he should not destroy it, but I found none. In this case here, there is no man. But look, there's lots of people here. There's lots of people here. So we really can't say today, God could not really say today that there's no one. Because there's us. We know that. There's us locally. There's not yet no one, anyway. Not today. I mean, but look, that, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. For two reasons, all right? We're here for two reasons. Number one, to, to tell the truth. To show the way. To shine the light. I mean, that, that's why we're here. To show people that don't know. So we're here, and we're going out, and we're doing these things. That's why we're here. To show other people the way so we're, there never will not be zero men. There never will be nobody. Because we were going to get more people. We want to get more people and more people. So there will always be someone to stand there, to stand in the gap and to, to form up the hedge. But also this. We're there to, to stand in the gap and to be that man so there will never be no one. Or at least it won't happen on our watch. But we're also here to show the Lord. Amen. We're also here to show the Lord that there's a remnant. Amen. And that there is a man that there is more than a man. Because in, that, in Ezekiel 22, he couldn't find one. But he can find one here. So we're to go out and show the people the truth, but we're to show the Lord that there is men. And there is people and women here that are willing to show the way. So there will always be a man. So look, it doesn't have to crash and burn. Not today anyway. I mean, you say, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to crash and burn. Well, we're here to do what we're supposed to do so we can be verse 15. So we can be Ezekiel 22, verse 30, and, and we can be that man. And we can do what we can do. Look, that's, that's really what life comes down to. That's really, I mean, so many people get so stressed out about situations. I even dealt with this today at my job. People get stressed out about situations. And I'm just like, hey, have you done everything you can do? Well, yeah, well, let's think about what we can do. We can do this, we can do this, we can do that. Have we done those three things? Yes. Then why are you worried? We've done everything. I mean, if we're just laying around doing nothing, then uh, a problem is stressful. If you just lay around and do zero. But look, we're standing. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And, and we're being that man. We're being, so we're showing the Lord this. That, that, that's the importance of this ministry. That's the importance of you in this ministry. Is we're showing the Lord that, you know, there is somebody here. And we're doing what we can do. As long as we're doing what we can do, it's going to be fine. Judges chapter 10. There's a lot we can learn from these cycles of civilization, even from a, a history professor's perspective when you look at um, the Bible. It's funny how, you know, um, even secular people will recognize patterns that the Bible has already showed us um, again and again and again. Judges chapter 10. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.